I know you've had uh, many of these uh, sessions already. I hope you've had a great time at them. Um, we've got a real cracker um, to end on. It's um, about the evolving nature of broadcasting uh, over the next decade. And we have got a uh, cracking panel for you today. Uh, obviously, today is... Um, uh, even today as we speak, there are two major developments going on. Uh, there's the BBC white paper have been announced and BT have obviously announced a deal uh, to screen um, uh, European uh, uh, Europa Cup and the Champions League uh, on YouTube, which is a, a very, very interesting development. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about social media, uh, cooperative deals and uh, much more besides. It is a really fantastic panel we've got here, so I wonder if you could welcome onto the stage uh, Delia Bushell, who is a BT's uh, uh, director, uh, managing director of um, TV and Sport, Barbara Slater, uh, who, uh, as well as carrying the flag into the 1976 Olympics, is that right? Well... <laughs> it's not quite right. It's not quite right. I was a gymnast, gymnast are small, so I was on the front row. <laughs> Nearly. Maybe not quite the flag. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, that's the scourge of um, uh, a journalist's uh, research tool. We can do that. There. And we've got Peter, Peter right. Barn, <laughs> chief executive of Peter Horton, sorry, chief executive officer of um, Eurosport. Thank you very much. <laughs> now the title of the talk obviously is uh, 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 deals with the. Uh, exponential growth that we're sort of seeing in broadcasting and the changes that we're seeing. But I wonder if I could just ask each of you in the time that you've been in the business to talk a little bit about the changes you've seen. I suppose to illustrate the fact that up until maybe the last five, ten years, change was that incremental. Peter, would you tackle that first? It's always a worrying sign when people ask you the question about how has it changed in your life in the business, which just shows you've been in the business too long, really. But, um, I think the biggest change for me as a Derby County fan is that you'd never get Derby County on TV when I was growing up. Um, and now I get to watch every game on the player, no matter where I am in the world. Um, and you could argue that's not really progress, but it, it's certainly something that I build my life around. And I think that idea that uh, you can watch virtually every sports event somehow, somewhere, wherever you are in the world, I think is a remarkable change and one that's really only happened in the last decade. Um, and by doing that, it also changes the nature of the business in that you are not the only option. You know, people are not going to watch you just because you're a sports channel. You have to have a, a very clear product proposition and be unique to stand out from that crowd of information, that crowd of media out there. So I think that's probably the biggest change for me. Do you? What about you? So obviously we are with a relative newcomer, you know, to the sports marketplace. And I think when we first burst onto the scene three years ago, it was very much because we saw a marketplace which wasn't really changing. Um, I think we felt there was a huge opportunity because premium sport, if anything, was becoming less and less accessible and more and more expensive. Um, and we felt there was an opportunity to really challenge and innovate, you know, both in pricing and business model in our production coverage, where we always had a vision of getting closer to the fans, being more pitch side. And then I think particularly on the, the digital innovation side, where while I think clearly the consumer marketplace was massively evolving in ubiquity of coverage and social media, it wasn't obvious to us that the sports marketplace was quite so much. So, you know, I think we then looked at things like being the first global live UHD sports channel, um, some of the things we've done with our Champions League app, in the past year where, you know, like, like what Peter was saying, we said, OK, for the first time in the UK, you've got the champions in the Europa League together under one broadcaster. Let's really put that to big effect. So let's have every single game live simultaneously on the app. You can choose your camera angles. You can bookmark the key goal moments. Um, you can rewind. You can, you can look at live stats, etc. So we felt that that was the opportunity, was to make that... The innovation that had been incremental suddenly to, to step change for everyone. Or what about you, and uh, okay. working for the BBC in particular, what well, are the changes? Uh, I'm not been? sure I want to admit for how long. <laughs> I joined uh, in the 80s, so I think it's been a, just an extraordinary change. Um, and I think that change, it's simply the amount, as you were saying, of, of coverage, the choice, the different ways sport is delivered. I mean, we have seen just an exponential 
increase in that. And we've seen trem tremendous innovations. I mean, I remember the Sydney Olympics when the BBC did its first fledgling uh, online page. And it didn't even, wasn't even a dedicated sport page. It was part of news. And, and I know that's a long time ago, but, but so you talk about change well, in the know. last five years. Actually, I think it's been extraordinary. Beijing, you started to see the first introduction of choice, the sort of the red button games, yeah. if you like. Beijing, probably the first digital games. And then you've got to look at 2012 as resetting the bar in how major events are covered with phenomenal choice, depth, cross-platform, etc. So we're seeing, I, I, I think, a, a, an, an industry, sports industry in the UK that is incredibly strong and sets the bar incredibly high. Just, just, let, just before we go on to talk about some of the changing natures of uh, audience expectations and so on, just let me ask you a bit about the white paper yeah. um, today. Obviously, uh, John Whittingdale um, has been presenting that. Um, various measures in there. Uh, the BBC Trust to go to be placed by a board. The government to have some sort of role in that. Um, protection of the licence fee for 11 rather than 10 years to take it away from election cycles. Um, the idea that um, anyone paid over £450,000 um, uh, uh, has to be identified in some sort of way, not quite clear quite how yet. Um, how are these going to impact on you, do you think? Well, I think the thing to say is, obviously, that white paper is, it, it, is, is, is literally off the press, and therefore the BBC will be formally responding to that. So I don't think it's right for me to, to, to do that. So will, will and Tony, Tony Hall, Hall be doing he, that? he is, and I think, I believe he is currently um, conducting interviews and doing presentations about the BBC's formal response, literally as we speak. So I don't, I don't, I don't think I should be going and, ahead, ahead. And can I just ask you one thing just on that? Yeah. There's nothing specific about sport, as well, you understand it's, it's it. it's obviously a high level. Um, I, I mean, there's probably just a couple of things that, that say, and I, I do think, you know, what we're hoping for, the priority of that white paper, you know, we, we very much is going to pave the way for a strong and independent BBC. Um, and, you know, that more than anything underpins what sport does, what other areas of the BBC do too. Um, it's, I think, there's massive public support for that. Um, and I think it's the strength of the BBC uh, over such a long period that has enabled us in sport to build such a world class production, operation and base. And yeah, I think you see that evidenced in coverage of the Olympics and Wimbledon, the World Cup. I mean, I could, I could, I could carry on with a list of, of events. Um, and, you know, I think there are teams there that, that bring great skill and experience, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, and we need that strong BBC to continue, uh, that we need to be in that environment uh, as to where we operate. Um, I know one of the aims of the paper is around competition, driving competition. I think we're well placed. We're already existing in an unbelievably competitive environment. Um, and just one thing, I think, to try and bring that to life, if we look at our TV production, 90% of that investment of that spend is contested and, and is, 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 if you like, competed for in some way. So, so I think there are some big ambitions uh, that the BBC has, uh, you know, and, and we hope that white paper, as I say, paves the way for a strong, robust BBC. There's actually one thing in that. <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> it happens every time there's Euros or it happens every time there's Olympics. Mm -hmm. You know, they, 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 there will be a story somewhere which is uh, BBC taking X number of people to the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how do you counter that accusation? And, and well, I, I think I have to um, speak to colleagues in the press who I think for our numbers, which we've now put in the public domain for Rio, we went with a headline 40% less than 2012. So we weren't sure quite what to make of that headline. Um, uh, these events take a large number of people to produce them to the calibre that audiences expect. I, I, I think we have to defend that position. I think there is an audience appetite for high quality coverage. There isn't an appetite for lavish, <coughs> over the top, etc. But I just think if you look at the record of, of what was done in 2012, if you look at what was done in Glasgow, if you look at what was done in Beijing, people want the Olympics covered well. They want the Olympics co covered. They want Wimbledon and those other crown jewel events. And that takes expertise, teams, high craft skills, and that drives numbers. 
But Peter, I'll come to you in the Olympics in just, just a minute. But Dina, you, you, you just again an announcement today that shows how things are moving on a pace. You announced today that um, uh, the uh, Champions League final and um, the Europa Cup final will be on YouTube. Uh, 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 tell us a little bit about that and what, why you've done that. So I think we've, from the start, been very much about um, reach and ubiquity. So from a sounding start, we, you know, we've reached over 5 million subscribers. And actually, this season to date, we've reached about 8.7 million homes in total. But I think we felt ready to take the next step. So we've actually announced three things today. Uh, one is that we will broadcast uh, both the Champions League and the Europa League, as opposed to the FA Cup final, um, on YouTube just to really maximise the digital impact of those events. Um, and the second is we're also going to put the BT Sport app to e-mobile customers. You know, there are 14, 24 million e-postpay, um, prepay homes out there. So while our reach has been quite incredible, an achievement in three years, we actually think that the BT EE integration gives us an opportunity to go a whole step further in, in mobile content reach. Um, and we're also actually going to put the BT Sport app onto TalkTalk Talk TV boxes, so we announced that as well. So those three things, I think, just help us both really drive the digital innovation agenda a bit more. And I think um, putting, I mean, obviously, you've got Liverpool in the Europa League finals, so there, isn't, there isn't a better story. And you've also got a challenge that the Basel Stadium is a very small stadium which doesn't hold that many fans. So you've got a lot of frustrated Liverpool fans who'd love to get there. <laughs> We're also working with Liverpool City to see whether we can put something on an outside broadcast as well. But we want to make those events huge. We're an all-Spanish Champions League final. So are you involved in the... Because there, there is talk about an, out, an outside screen, isn't there? In the yes, we are trying to work with the football club oh. and, the, and the city council to try and make it as big as possible in the centre of Liverpool as well. So we basically want to make both these events have the maximum impact and reach that they possibly can and let all viewers get access to them. So YouTube is one of the ways of doing it. And for us also, it's a smart digital innovation to partner up with them. It'll help drive more, more leads for us on people who are you know, hot prospect football fans um, for our marketing initiatives. So for, on many levels, it's, it's, a, it's a good strategy for us to follow. Just before moving on, can I ask you a little bit about Showcase? Um, your free to air um, freeview channel. Um, are you disappointed with the figures on that? No, I mean the figures are. I mean the figures are pretty amazing. So if you take this season to date, BT Sport overall is up fifty five percent year on year in audience reach or share. Sky Sports is down six percent, and and Eurosport are, are flat. So from basic statistics, it's been a phenomenal year. You know, I guess, ironically, obviously. Charlie Sale, I don't know if Charlie's here, he actually came to see us um, last week and we showed him all the actual statistics and he said, wow, you've actually got a great story, why haven't you been telling it? So, you know, I think on that well, basis... Well, why, well, why haven't you? Well, I think, I think we, we sort of tend to get on with the job of producing great sports coverage rather than putting out, you know, spin stories, but I think we probably should be better at telling that story. Um, I think... Showcase for us was something, we always had a commitment to UEFA that we would make a certain number of games available on free to air. And we absolutely wanted to make that commitment. But clearly our business model is a pay business model. We're not a ratings driven business. Uh, we're much more about having a very low price, three or five pound pay proposition go out to as many people as possible. And especially those who before had to pay 55, 60 quid to get hold of premium football. So. From that perspective, it's you know we've done exactly what we set out to do, and you know for our business, the overall ratings have been fantastic this year. Um, the pay ratings for Champions League are higher than they were on Sky last year, so it's been a really great year from that perspective. So we're very happy, and UEFA are delighted. You know I think the, the partnership for UEFA has created a global halo for them in how they can now sell their rights, which you know they're ecstatic with. Peter, Eurosport flat. Um, well, I think we're 20% on POM two years ago, so um, we're going in the right direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I think at any point in the year you can, you can quote a point, but I think um, f for us the, the story has been what we've done across Europe, really, where I think over the two years we're now about 25% up over the whole of Europe, which businesses just don't do that over a long course of, of time and analysis over a long course of time. But we've done it by really changing the whole business, and I think... Um, you know, you talk from the start about how you, you change the whole industry. Eurosport has been part of the industry from the start, you know, in terms of the pay business of, of sport in Europe. So to change an old brand like that is a really big job. 
and uh, I think we've made big progress on it in the last year and a half and it's really been a year since Discovery took control of the business. Um, so we're going in the right direction. Just talking with Barbara and Dewey there about the, the, the events today, obviously your big event was uh, Discovery in the, in, in the Olympics, so what's the, what was the rationale for that? What was the, uh, you know, that's a, is that a quantum leap into something else? Or, well, I think, um, like I came into the job about a year ago and when I came in Discovery gave me the big speech which you, you're never really sure when you first come into a job and they said we want to transform the business and they'd already done lots of, of, of small things to try and change the business and you do all these little activities around smaller events and local rights and, and personalising the channel but nothing has changed the perception of the business bigger than that one big decision. Um, you know, and I think in the UK particularly because of the history of what the BBC left from, from London. Um, but across Europe it's changed the way that people see Eurosport. For us to be the gateway of the Olympics, the home of the Olympics for basically the next eight years after Rio um, is, is a huge step forward for us. But it's also a sign of ambition, it's a sign of change. And we rebranded on air, but the rebrand on air was sort of really on the back of the Olympics because it is a new product and, um, and that's quite an exciting time for us. Can we, can we move on a little bit and let's talk a little bit about how things are changing with audience expectation. Um, Peter, why, why don't you take, take, take this first? Um, uh, you know, you, you alluded to it there as a Derby County supporter, as a young man, you had some success in the 70s, didn't you? Quite a while ago, that. Um, uh, um, but you know, we, we used to quite enjoy one, one or two live games of football a year. You had, uh, when I was growing up in Scotland, you had a couple of uh, uh, pretty poor packages put together of, uh, of uh, uh, local league and so on. Um, uh, but it's not just about live, it's not just about the live experience that people want. There's, the, 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 yeah. there's, there's other elements to it. Absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that we're changing about our business, I think, is, is symbolic of how the industry is changing, where you say, if we have a major event, you have to really immerse yourself in that event, and that involves multiple screens, it involves layers of data, that involves allowing people to really saturate themselves in the big sport event. And I think, um, you know, I keep referring back to Derby County, but that sadly is what I do. Um, you want every bit of information about things you care about. So you go deeper and deeper into the sports events that are things that touch your heart. You know, if you're a cycling fan and you want to watch the Tour de France, you, know, you want to watch every minute of the Tour de France. You want to have it all available to you and you want the data, you want the second stream that tells you this is where the, the riders are on the course, this is the profile of the hills, you want the heart rate, you want the information that, that tells you the stories behind the story. And I think that's the reality of the business we're in now. It's not serving... Do, do people really want that, actually? I think they do, because I think you want that available to you. You want the depth of story. You look at the way the Telegraph covers stories now. When it comes to a big event, you've got six, seven different articles around that big event from different angles, different um, positions. You've got far more graphic information about the way that the yeah, People obviously want the what's in the Telegraph. Well, some people do. And, um, <laughs> but I think it's a good uh, example of a, a TV viewer is no different. You want that multiple perception of an event. You want to be able to go as deep and as, as, as into the depth of the story as you can get. Um, and people are going deeper and deeper into the story. And while they might not choose to take every single bit of data, if that data really gives you the detail that informs you about the event better, then it makes you care about the event better. And if you wanted to sum up what... TV sports should be about, it's making you care about what you're watching more. Um, so therefore, all those other screens, all those other bits of data, all those other bits of information helps a viewer care more about the event. And then you've done a good job. Barbara. Well, I was going to say, I mean, the, you know, the session is how will traditional broadcasting evolve. I, I don't think we should move on too quickly from the power of that traditional broadcasting. I mean, if, if, if we look ahead to this summer of sport, with the Euros, when we've done a Rio games, I mean, our hope is that over 90% of the UK population will access some of that sport. There is still enormous power in that traditional live TV broadcast of delivering the mass audience. And I think what you're yeah. talking about is fantastic and it's complementary and expectations are, are so much higher. An audience is so much more sophisticated. It wants control, it wants choice. Sometimes it want, wants depth, yeah. but I think what it does want is, is also that 
part of belonging to a great event, to share it, to enjoy it, and know that others have also experienced it and enjoy it in, in the, the water cooler moment, if you like. Yeah, and I think all, traditional all, broadcasting is still very powerful in yeah. delivering that. But it's also using those other media forms as a way of dragging people in. You know, one of the great things about what the BBC can offer is, is an automatic high audience, effectively, for a big sports event. And I think it's very important for us then in a, a pay environment to say you need to create lots of stepping stones to a sport. It's important not to just have it behind a paywall and what Delia is doing on the, on the Champions League is a great example, but you know, to have lots of short form content out there that tells you the stories, that gets you emotionally engaged and tries to demystify a sporting event, allow people to get engaged with it, and then hopefully they will start want to immerse themselves. Yeah. But it's about being complementary. I was going to say, I think about being correct in the sense that yeah. clearly a major live football game is a must-have live viewing experience that you want to do on a big screen. Um, but I think what we've done is we've tailored it by sport. So we find, for example, there are things like MotoGP or UFC, which are much more geared to the digital environment, where either the coverage is going on across a weekend, so people aren't going to watch the whole thing live. They want to see it broken down into bite-sized clips. They want to pull it on social media as the weekend progresses, or things like UFC, where the big fights are in the middle of the night. We still get a huge live audience of several hundred thousand, but then there's another mass of X million who want to see the highlights broken down the following morning when they wake up. But, you know, exactly as Peter said, I think it's fun. If people want to be immersed in the experience and they want you to be able to take, get you close to the action all the time. And we're certainly seeing new, new opportunities because I, I think there is also an appetite for that behind the scenes insight. Yes. And uh, I mean, Claire, who I know was on this panel just before, was talking about a, an, a piece she'd done on Facebook Live on her phone, literally meandered around and a little intro to the course she was at badminton yeah. horse trials. Um, the, on, on Facebook, that audience has now reached 1.5 million. We did something similar with Anton Joshua. Yeah. Again, that behind the scenes, much more intimate, getting people much closer to how the story is told. Uh, and, and again, that sort of engagement of so audiences. Um, so it, yes, I'm not really arguing that, that traditional broadcasting doesn't need to change and it doesn't need to complement. I suppose I'm just saying we shouldn't write it off too quickly. <laughs> let, let me ask a question at SportsRight and let me start with you, Deliana. You paid um, 897 million for the um, Champions League uh, uh, in, in Europa uh, Cup um, for a three-year deal. The Premier League deal is what, 8.4 billion. Uh, uh, Steve Parish, in, in, interestingly, yesterday said that actually the Premier League could be getting far more. They're getting 10 million for a game. They could be getting 50 million for a Manchester United Liverpool game. Where does it all end? You know, where does it end for you know, uh, let's say someone not quite in their first flush of youth who isn't into what Peter's been talking about, all the gizmos and all the wine bang, but you know, wants, wants, to, watch a, wants to watch a game, uh, but probably doesn't want to spend 60 or 80 quid a month in, 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 in doing it. Well, where does it end in terms of how much you pay, what that means for us, the viewer, and actually what it means for, this is one thing I think is quite interesting, the impact it has on the game itself, because of course, footballers are completely divorced now from uh, you know, the, the public that they serve. So I think obviously what we very much have made our ethos is bringing sport and particularly football back to the fans and getting the prices down. So if you want Premier League, Champions League, Europa League football now, you can get it free just by getting a BT TV box. Um, whereas before that, that, that opportunity wasn't really there. So I think for us, bringing competition to the sports rights marketplace has been, has been great for fans. Um, clearly, it's created lots of lots more competition and you know challenges on price inflation of sports rights. But provided it's done in the way that we're doing it, where we're not, you know, we're making sure we try not to penalise the fans in that sense. We're actually giving them the opportunity to get hold of things they couldn't reach before. Then I think it's I think it's really good and. It's a bit, as we were saying behind the scenes, just then, it's a bit like London house prices. How you predict what the future looks like is very difficult. There will be periods of inflation, periods of stabilisation, and every rights bid is very individual and very unpredictable. Um, you know, clearly what happened in the Premier League auction was pretty seismic. And, you know, if you're a player as dominant as Sky and you're determined to defend your rights and you will pay whatever is required to stop any competition coming in, that's... that dynamic is still there 
Um, um, but it varies you? from one rights auction to another how that Sorry works. Yeah. I think um, it's also important to say that you don't want to lock premium sports events behind a very expensive wall because in the end you kill the event. You know, I think if you talk to people in the golf industry, for example, and you see what's happened around Asia and Europe with golf channels, you've often seen golf only being available at this very high premium tier, which means that your demographic gets older and older, you don't get kids experiencing the sport, you get no sense of golf heroes, and the golf audience is getting older and older because of that way of broadcasting it. I think really important that you have the tiering and you have things available in different ways across digital, across free-to-air, across basic cable, across premium. And, and that's thankfully what Discovery do in their range of their business because we've got free-to-air channels in big chunks of Europe. But I think if you want to grow with a sport and you can do a long-term <laughs> deal with a sport, then the story that they want most is a story which is absolutely perfect. It's how do we grow the audience for the sport and how do we monetize it at the top end? And if you can balance those two things out, then you're yeah. going down the right yeah. sort of route. And I think we, we're probably both about yeah. to say the same thing, which is the yeah. FA Cup is a brilliant example of mm. that, where yeah. we partner very closely together yeah. with our teams. Yeah. It's been fantastic for the, the franchise itself, which has now seen massive audience growth, because not only have they managed to monetize it effectively with a free pay split, but we actually collaborate as broadcasters yes. together on the promotion, the sharing of clip rights and so on, to make that I mean, to get it I think you've got a case there of a rights holder who, who in a way has got the best of both worlds because there, yeah. there is a, a way that those rights have been packaged in a way that's created a really good uh, package for BT but also a really good package for BBC and free to air. And I think one of the really encouraging things is I think your audience has been up 30%. Yeah. And I think the BBC has actively ass assisted in, 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 in that I in increased reach. So overall, the first year that the FA Cup was back on the BBC, the reach of the FA Cup was an additional 9 million people. That is, is, is a huge step up. Um, and actually, it was already in a free-to-air space, at least. Absolutely. And, and that's, um, I think, how that, that packaging, how things are bundled and a balance between pay and free-to-air is a really important consideration for, for rights holders. I, th I think you take your sport entirely behind the paywall at, at your peril. But go on, Barbara, you must admit it, you must have the hardest job in sport, haven't you? I think I've got the best job in sport. Um, I mean, just, just pause, pause for a moment and think about the summer of sport we have ahead. The Euros, three home nations. Oh, don't rub it in, don't Wimbledon. rub it in. Yeah. Uh, followed by a Rio Olympics. I mean, that is e extraordinary. More people access sport through the BBC than any other media organisation. How can that be the hardest job in sport? Very good. OK, I have, <laughs> I have to take questions now. I'm so sorry I haven't got to earlier. I'm such a lax moderator. Anyway, questions? Sir. Thank you. Uh, Simon from Repucom. Uh, for many years, you've had the key to, to the cupboard for sports properties, for viewers, for brands. We're talking about the future. When something as, as new uh, as eSports comes along and provides an access to such a valuable demographic, how do you react to something like that? And on what basis would you decide to play in that space? Well, I could, I could go first on that one. Please, go on. Um, I, I think one of the things that... that, that uh, you're absolutely right about that demographic and being um, a, a demographic that, that, that I think people are really keen to engage with. Um, we've actually done a partnership with BBC Three because we know BBC Three is particularly good at that demographic. So it was quite interesting. We did the event at Wembley um, and actually covered it very much as a sport event. So we produced it for BBC Three. And I think that gave an ideal feeler in, in, into that kind of territory. And it was, the parallels with sport was amazing. And there's probably... A, I'm sure there is a massive debate about is it sport, isn't it sport, etc. But there is absolutely no question about the enthusiasm and actually the appreciation of giving it that kind of treatment. We got tremendous feedback from those that, that really enjoyed it. So I would say it's tentative, first steps, exploiting a, a space, if you like, or partnerships, particularly geared at that demographic. So, so, so for us, it's, it's, it's exploring. I think, yeah, sorry, it's, it's hugely interesting because of the sponsorship potential of it. 
and the fact that it allows you to target an audience that is not necessarily a TV audience anymore. And I think platforms like Twitch are fascinating in terms of the loyalty they've now got as a, as a platform to host multiple events. I just don't see it necessarily as pay TV content. I think it's a demographic that expects that content for free. Um, and if we can work with them in a way that's uh, a way that recognizes how they want to experience the content and we can help make that available to a sponsorship audience, there's loads to be done. But it's certainly not um, covering live events on pay TV. So I have to differ with that. <laughs> so I, I think BT probably looks at it from the whole company lens, where I think this is potentially right in our sweet spot in the sense that we've got live sports and then you know we've got high-speed broadband and clearly gamers are right in the sweet spot of high-speed broadband and live sport. So we've done a couple of trials so far. We've done um, Gfinity um, Formula E and we've done um, KSI versus Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain in a live FIFA football game. Um, but I think for us, how we pull that together into some kind of clear proposition for gamers that marries broadband and sport is, what, is what's interesting for us because we're not thinking of it just as a, a pay sport broadcaster. We're thinking it more as BT itself. So. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's Callum Murray from Sport Cal. Um, a question for Peter. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The Olympics deal has transformed the uh, the perception of Eurosport um, across Europe, across the world, probably. But um, otherwise, since the uh, takeover, um, uh, most of the deals you've done have been for individual territories. Are there any other kind of pan-continental deals you could do, like the Olympics, or is that uh, a one-off? Yeah, I mean, I think look, you, you look at the deal we've done with the Australian Open or the US Open tennis, for example, were both sort of pan-European deals, and the nature of those deals has definitely changed from what Eurosport did historically, which was sharing the content with free-to-air broadcasters. So you've got more exclusivity in certain things we are buying. But I think also we're serving very different audiences from the top of Norway down to um, Indonesia or Australia, if I get my geography right. Um, so as a result, to buy multiple territory with one sport to serve all those, ter all those audiences is pretty tough um, because they don't want to. You know, some of the winter sports we have on the channel now you know, clearly doesn't go down very well in Portugal and Greece. Um, so as we have the uh, flexibility to change our beams, to make our content more local by targeting an audience better, then pan-European deals become less and less attractive. The converse to that, though, is that there's clearly a trend to do one big media partner deal directly with the Federation. And I think the Olympics is also a sign of that, that you see the big federations not necessarily going with the agencies and big guarantees, but saying, can they work with a Discovery? Can they work with a Sky? Can they work with a, a Fox? Can they work with a Be In across multiple markets, which offers a, a, a solidity and a, and a guarantee of exposure and money that a lot of federations do find quite attractive. Gentleman at the back, hand up. It's uh, Martin Ziegler from the Times. Uh, Delia, people I've spoken to at UEFA have been um, not too happy with your, the, the audience figures for the free-to-air matches you put on on the Champions League. Um, will you put your, the matches on YouTube uh, for the next season, your free-to-air matches? No, we do, we're doing this just as an event for the final because we want the finals of both to just be you know, a huge national event, and particularly with Liverpool in the Europa League final, it's a, it's a big moment for everyone. Um, but, I mean, our conversation with UEFA, they've been delighted with the deal that they have done with us. Um, they knew when, when we did the deal that we were never going to major the free-to-air component because, obviously, the business model on which we, we had done the deal was more pay-centric, and they've been always very sort of relaxed and phlegmatic about it. I think they probably will have a choice to go on how they package next time round between either being you know, more pay or more purist on the free side. But, um, but you know, that's, that's the kind of choice that I think they will, they will take when the time is right. Um, I think the more important thing for them was the global halo effect of the deal they had done with us, where when they then went on to do their other territory deals, they found that there was a real sense that a new incumbent, a new competitor could come in and challenge an incumbent on the rights, um, which obviously for them is critical to competitive intensity in each market. Any more questions? Ben. 
Hi, Ben Ramsby from the Telegraph. Hello. Um, question both to Delia and Barbara. You've spoken glowingly about the tie-up with the FA Cup between the BBC and BT Sport. Do you think that this could be made to work in the Champions League when the next deal comes up, either with the BBC or, or with ITV? And particularly to Barbara, is, is the Champions League something that could be on your radar considering all the cuts that have been made recently? I think it's for, UEFA, it's for UEFA to decide what they do with their rights next time round, so I couldn't really comment. But Yeah, I think it's difficult to comment on individual rights, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you're never going to shut the door to anything, are you? Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there's no you know, question that, that, that we have to prioritise. That's the reality of, of, of living in the environment in which we do. So I think it, it's difficult to, to comment on an individual sport or set of rights. Gentleman over there. Thanks, Carl from Hawkeye. Um, you mentioned consumer choice and decisions of the customer, and um, looking at organisations like the NFL who've done deals with Twitter now, non non traditional broadcasting partners, ADP Media doing their streaming. Um, obviously, the BT YouTube deal is impressive, but. The NBA, for example, has their Game Pass product, which is directly to consumers, and more rights holders are building up bigger audiences on their own platforms. I'm just keen to hear what your thoughts and opinions on somebody like the NBA doing that directly to the consumer and where you fit into that in the future. Peter, we, we actually partner with the NBA in, in exactly that model in multiple markets in Europe where we have a Eurosport player a business where we provide content direct to consumer, so not via a, a pay platform. And the NBA are working with us and selling together on that sort of model. I think it's an important part of what we offer now. And I think it's something that we see grow all the time. And I think for individual sports, you know, to have a direct relationship with their consumer is obviously something that's very attractive. But I think there's also a power in the brand. And if you have 45 different OTT offerings out there offering different sports, um, you're not attracting a new audience. So I think for a, a sport to be able to work with a recognized brand uh, packaged together with them and then sell direct to a consumer is a really interesting way that we'd certainly look at doing more and more in the future. And I think what was just interesting, just picking up on, 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 on the FA Cup and part of the pitch to the FA from the BBC was around taking the FA Cup into different spaces. So I think Pointless had its highest ever audience with its FA Cup special. I think the one show had its highest audience for two years with the draw. If you go to GCSE Bite Size, you will find a FA free kick is the demonstration of, I'm not sure, angles and flight, etc., etc. So I think taking uh, and making sure that you are allowing events to reach a much wider audience, not necessarily the specialist fan, is, is really, really important. So I, I, I accept what you say, that, that I think there are great opportunities for sports to go direct to their fans, but I actually think sports also need to take their sport to a, a, a wider and different audience. And, and, and Game Pass yes. is a great example, right? Because it's a brilliant product. It's got a huge volume of content yeah. there. But in no market do the NBA just sell themselves with Game Pass. They always have a broadcast deal as well. Um, and they see it very much as a pyramid, that a certain audience will watch them on the, uh, on the broadcast element. The broadcast element often promotes the Game Pass. And then if you want that deeper emotive immersion experience, then you can pay for the premium. And the interesting thing for rights holders, how they exploit all of those different opportunities that, that now present themselves um, and balance how they, they package up and, and, and spread their rights across uh, what, what's a very, very different environment now. Quickly, one last one, anybody? Very quickly. Hi, I just wanted to ask, so there's a, the amount of um, peer-to-peer websites that are out there at the moment, the amount of live streaming that's going on, do you guys fear that that may slowly sort of stop um, the way you guys show live sports, so that may take over with internet getting a lot quicker, and um, sponsorship deals for the rights to the Premier League and to the Champs League, just getting stupid amounts of money now, um, do you fear that you may lose some a lot of viewers down to these illegal websites and, and peer-to-peers. Do you, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, 
Yeah, and I, it's absolutely something that we monitor very closely. And you know, whether it's us monitoring interventions into the BT Sport live streams or Premier League and UEFA, Europa, uh, Europa League, etc., monitoring them themselves, it's a key part of the dynamic of the rights holder broadcaster relationship and it's important to keep doing that. I don't think at the moment it's of a magnitude to undermine at all the, the broadcast rights and certainly the ratings have been going up and up so that demonstrates that but I do think that you know the combination of that and all the EU digital frontiers piece we've got to be careful that we protect the value of these rights and, and make sure that you know the business model reflects the growth or the constraint around that. I think one story relevant to that, when, when I was working in India, we had enormous problems with peer-to-peer with, uh, -peer sites being everywhere. And um, the way we countered it was we actually made our own feed free uh, as a stream, and we sold commercials on it. And because the quality of that feed was so much better, that actually killed the peer-to-peers better than anything else, because people knew where to go. They knew they have a quality experience. And it was a, a premium that they, they didn't bother doing the alternative sites. So I think you certainly always have to think about making a digital offering available because the reality is that some people want to consume in that way. Barbara? Well, I think, um, I, I mean, our whole approach is around, if you like, trying to get sport to the widest possible audience. And, and I'm not saying we want that to just happen peer-to-peer, -peer, of course not. But um, in, in some ways, I'm not sure we've quite got the same, the, the same issues. Um, it, it, it's... it's an element of that is going to happen. Is that really going to be mainstream, how, how people want to access sport? I'm not, I'm not sure it is. So I think that there's, that will always be a challenge. I'm sure sports rights management um, will, will get more sophisticated too in terms of, 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 of how that will work longer term. So I, I think it's something that's at the edges. I, I don't see it as a fundamental threat though, no. Okay, I think that is our allotted time, guys. Um, I think it's been a very good debate. Um, uh, thank you very much to the panel, Barbara Slater, Peter Hutton, Dario Bushel. It's um, been really uh, fantastic, really grateful for you coming along and for your time. Thank you. Great.